Hallelujah. Do you know who invented music? And do you know what it was invented for? Worship God. The Almighty is the one that invented music. Turn up in your Bible to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 12 tonight. Second Samuel chapter number 12. Second Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 24. The infallible text says, And David comforted Bathsheba his wife, and went in unto her, and lay with her, and she bare a son. And he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him. Father, we pray now that you'd bless the reading, the preaching, the hearing of thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As the Bereans search the scripture, more noble than any of the rest, to see if these things be so, you will never make the Lord mad at you by studying the Bible amen. and searching these things out and comparing scripture with scripture and let the word of God define itself. In the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 12, and verse 24, and, and thus we have the beginning of Solomon. God blessed Bathsheba, who had originally been the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Bathsheba in Hebrew means the daughter of Sheba. And so we have here an, an indication of many of them in the Bible where God directly intervenes in the birth of someone to bring them on this earth. Now, folks, don't misunderstand. There's only been one virgin birth, yes, one virgin birth. But there have been a number of divine births throughout the Bible where the Lord opens the womb, as he did in the case of Sarah and others, to give them child. For example, he opened the, the womb of Rachel after Leah was having one after another after another. Finally, God opened the womb of Rachel, and she bore a child. And so it goes. The Bible tells us here, though, in the book of 2 Samuel, that Solomon has been uh, conceived. She, he is conceived, and she bare a son, and his name was Solomon. In the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 3 and verse number 5, one of the most beautiful passages in all the Bible, it says this, 1 Kings, chapter 3 and verse number 5. It's time now for Solomon to come into manhood. He's been a boy. He's grown up in the home of his father David, his mother Bathsheba, and no question that David certainly loved Bathsheba. He had other wives. Yes, he did. He was a polygamist, had concubines and all that. You never go to David to get someone to come to counsel about marriage. <laughs> Not the man, neither Solomon. But the fact of the matter is he certainly did love Bathsheba and he loved Solomon. And here in the book of 1 Kings chapter number 3 and verse number 5 in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and said, God said, ask what I shall give thee. Now that's, in other words, you would say it today in this culture in America, here's a blank check. What will you have me to do for you? Many times in the New Testament, the Lord would say to someone who is in dire need, what would you have me to do for you? That, my friend, is a mark of your maturity, and it's a mark of your character when you answer a question like that, when God says, what would you have me to do for you? Ask of me and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. He said in Jeremiah chapter number 33, I believe the Lord answers prayer. He doesn't answer it according to our time clock. He doesn't answer it according sometimes what we want, but God does answer prayer. And here in the book of 1 Kings, he said to Solomon, ask what I shall give thee. Now the Lord knew before he ever asked Solomon what Solomon would say. He knew what he would ask. God had a reason for, for presenting it to him in this manner. Not that God wanted to know what he was going to ask. He wanted Solomon to know what Solomon was going to ask and teach him a lesson right off the bat. In 1 Kings chapter number 4 and verse number 29, God answered Solomon. In 1 Kings chapter number 4 and verse number 29, he answered him. And here's what it said. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. That largeness of heart means he was a generous man. 
He was generous. He gave to those that were in need. So all the good characteristics that you can find for someone, we find them in Solomon. And the Bible says that he had the wisdom of God, understanding exceeding much. And he goes on to talk about in verse 31, he was wiser than all the men, than Ethan, the Ezraite, Heman, and Chalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all nations round about. Obviously, these are men of great renown in his time period, that people knew them. They had a reputation of being wise men. And so Solomon's wisdom excelled all of theirs. God gave Solomon wisdom. Of course, if you read the Bible, you understand God gave him far more than that. He gave him riches. He gave him wealth. He gave him fame. In all of these things, the Lord gave to Solomon. Now turn to Second Chronicles chapter number 5 and verse number 13. Second Chronicles chapter number 5 and verse number 13. Solomon builds the house of the Lord. And the Bible said it came to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, note carefully, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. Amen. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Let me say a little something right here. It's very important. You cannot minister to the glory of God. You cannot add anything to the glory of God. When the glory of God shows up, it's time for us to back off. For God will not share his glory with anyone or anything. He'll share his grace. He'll share his mercy. He'll share his love. He has an abundant supply that he can share with us. But glory, no. The glory belongs to God. And so when the glory of the Lord came down into the temple, it was time then for all to back out and to remove themselves and to observe the glory of that eternal absolute being. We've only seen a little bit of it. The Bible says in the book of in the New Testament that we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Lord Jesus Christ had an aura of glory about him in the sense that he was a sinless man, in the sense that he was completely dedicated to the will of God, in the sense that he could perform any miracle that he pleased, but all he did, he did it according to the will of God. And on the cross he offered himself and sacrificed for our sins in complete obedience to the Father and then submitted his soul and spirit into the hands of the Father. And there at the cross at Calvary, he gave himself. On the third day, he arose from the dead and he walked on this earth, risen man, a man that is victor over death, hell, and the grave, our Lord Jesus Christ. We beheld his glory. His glory is a manifest glory for his creatures. We are his creatures. We saw a good deal 2,000 years ago of what he wanted us to see. But we understand this tonight without question. The Apostle John says, It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we see him, we shall, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, as he is now glorified in the presence of Almighty God. So God will not share his glory with anything. They had to move out from the temple. In Second Chronicles chapter number 7 and verse number 1, when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering, the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Isn't that a remarkable thing? And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And so they had to step back and let the glory of God fill his temple. Amen. Amen. That must have been quite a sight. In the Old Testament, by the way, for people to know that God had received the sacrifice, the fire of God would fall upon the offering, on the altar. And the fire of God would come down and consume the offering and the altar. We know that back in the book of Genesis when Abel brought a sacrifice to the Lord, the Bible said God respected it. He offered it. He received it. He, res he respected his offering and received it, but he rejected Cain's offering. We know at the top of Carmel when Elijah built that altar to, uh, to the Lord God and filled it with water, the scripture says that the fire of God fell came down and licked up the water and consumed the sacrifice. This was God's way of showing that it had been received, and so it was. 2,000 years ago when the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross, the fire of God's wrath fell upon him too and consumed him in every sense that he could be consumed. The Bible says that he saw the travail of his soul, he saw the suffering of his soul, and was satisfied. 
And so it was that God received from his son. So now we come to something tonight that I don't know if you've ever noticed or not. But we're not going to read the whole 11th chapter of the book of, uh, of Hebrews. The 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. I just want you to get home tonight. And when you get home or whenever you have an opportunity, if you have a concordance, if you have a Bible concordance on a, on a, uh, on a computer, uh, I want you to look through the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews and you'll read the chapter of faith. This is the chapter of the victors. This is the chapter of the sufferers, but they're the conquerors. Through faith, he teaches us that they conquered. David's name's in there. Samson's name's in there. Abraham's in there. Sarah's in there. David's in there. But you won't find Solomon. Of all of the men in the Old Testament, he undoubtedly was one of the richest. Of all the men on the earth in the Old Testament, he was probably one of the wisest. Probably one of the best known. But his name is not in Hebrews chapter number 11. You ought to go home and you ask yourself a question. Why is he not in there? I mean, after all, David was a sinner. Sarah laughed at God when God told her that she was going to have a baby. He, she laughed about it. And God, of course, has a sense of humor. She had to name that boy Isaac, which means laughter. And Samson committed suicide. He pulled the temple of Dagon down on his head. The Bible says that it had 3,000 women and, and men on top of the roof of that thing. And it says that he killed more in his death than he had in his life. So Samson committed suicide. That ought to give a lot of people hope because a lot of people uh, have family members or friends or even ministers, and I've known a few myself down through the years. One minister out there in uh, Lenore City went to, the, went to the door of the church and blew his brains out, committed suicide. And then people will immediately say, well, he went to hell. Well, Samson didn't go to hell. He's listed in the hall of faith. Amen. But Solomon is not in there. So immediately after, you have to ask yourself this question, why, not, why, why, why is Solomon not in there? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Why is Solomon not in there? Why? I mean, after all, they're all sinners. Yes, they are. But you're looking at the Hebrews chapter number 11 is an illustration of faith and victory and overcoming the power of God in a person's life. The things that we face is, as Christians and believers and people. The Bible says the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We're not exempt from these things. It rains on the just and the unjust. We understand that. We know that. So why is Solomon not in there? The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 1, Solomon loved many strange women. Together the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said, The children of Israel, ye shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. He played with them for a while. He played with all of this for a while. He fancied himself as one because of all the wisdom that God had given him that he no doubt could control it. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Now watch this. For it came to pass when Solomon was old. It goes on to say that Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the god of the Zidonians, Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place to Shemash, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their God. As I've told you before, Solomon wrote three books in the Bible. He didn't write all the Proverbs, but he wrote many of them. He wrote the Song of Solomon. He wrote many of the Proverbs, and he wrote Ecclesiastes. He wrote Ecclesiastes later in his life. He wrote the Song of Solomon early in his life. Somewhere along the midway, he wrote many of the Proverbs because of his great wisdom that God had given him. He was manifesting this wisdom, and people listened to Solomon. They watched him. They followed him. But the book of Ecclesiastes is a fatalistic book. I have never been able to go to the book of Ecclesiastes and get inspired. 
I believe it's Scripture. I accept it as Scripture. It has a reason to be in the canon of Scripture. But it is as a man sees things under the sun. The book of Ecclesiastes, to me, is the crying of a man whose heart, soul, and spirit has not been inspired by the Lord God. And when you get to the point to where God no longer is your joy and your inspiration and your reason for living, and the Lord Jesus Christ is not the love of your life, then you hold on to all of your orthodoxy, but your power is gone. Because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our what? Exactly. And so when that's gone, then what have you left with? And somewhere along the line, Solomon started to get old and his heart softened toward these wives. And he not only listened to them, he was no longer listening to them, he was practicing their religion. Molech and Ashtoreth, I want to pull two of them out of these that are mentioned. Ashtoreth is Ishtar and all the other names that you'll find for her. She's a goddess. But one of the characteristics of Ashtoreth is this. They worshiped her as the creator. Oh boy. As the creator. Can you imagine how the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob felt? When this man that he had given so much wisdom to fell on his knees and worshipped Ashtoreth as the creator. And he had said it publicly, O oh Lord God, thou art the one that has brought into existence everything there is. You see, the way to God never changes. God's approach to man never changes. God's place never changes. He's always consistent about that. He never changes in that sense. In that sense, this is one of those terms we use in the Bible. It's called immutability, the immutability of God. And thank God for it, that he's not one way one day, what day with us and another way the next day. And we never know what to expect when we talk to him, you know, and, and, he's, and, he's, and he's emotional or he's mad or this or that. No, he's the same all the time. Amen. Hallelujah to God for that. He's the same. And we don't have to go to him and appease him. We don't have to bring some kind of an offering to make him to, 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 to I don't want to get too deep in this junk, but in the New Testament, they had a thing during that period of time called a votive offering. How many of you know what a votive offering is? A votive offering is an offering given to one of their gods of a part of the human body. Now let your mind think tonight. Let it think. Archaeologists have found in the ruins of pagan cultures many artifacts shaped like parts of the human body. Don't need to say any more. You understand what I'm saying? And so when they come to their God, they come to their God, and if there's a special need about their body or something about their life or something of that nature, then they bring this votive offering unto their God and offer it up unto their God. In plainer words, it is a, an appeasing offering. It is something specific and they're giving God something. And here's something that you need to understand tonight. God's already given us everything. You can't give him anything. The only gift that a man can give God, as I've said to you before, the only thing that you can give God that he hadn't already given you is thanks. You can be thankful. That's the only thing. That's the only thing. You say, well, I give God my faith. He gave you the faith to give back to him in faith. I worship God. You do because he saved you. He gave you salvation. And on it goes. I bring an offering and I give a tithe. So, yes, but the Lord gave you a job, two hands, a mind, gave you the, the ability to earn, make wealth. God gave it to you to begin with. But thankfulness, thankfulness is one of the truest marks of your character. Thankfulness. And so Solomon, Solomon, when he was old, the Bible said his heart was turned from God. Now here's the question. Here's the part that I have to think through and have to, bothers me tonight. This is what bothers me about Solomon. It bothers me greatly. I can't find anywhere in that Bible, can you, where Solomon ever came back to God. Can you find it? Not a word. That's why he's not in Hebrews chapter number 11. Not because he sinned. David was a murderer. No, 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 no. God does not exclude anyone from fellowship with him because you've sinned. The fellowship is broken when you refuse to acknowledge it and accept the sacrifice that's been made for it. 
if we have fellowship one with another, then the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. That cleansing is a present tense active participle. He is cleansing us from all sin. To walk in fellowship with God means that to walk in that fellowship, to commune with the Lord, and the very act of it is cleansing your sin from your body and your spirit and your soul. You are being cleansed, and that's what God wants. That's what He wants from us. He wants us to acknowledge how weak we are, how dependent we are, and how far we are from God without His hand drawing us nigh unto Him. To acknowledge in His presence as the old sinner did didn't so much as lift his head toward heaven. He said, God, be merciful to me, Amen. a sinner. Amen. And the Bible said he went down to his house justified. Amen. So Solomon doesn't show up in Hebrews chapter number 11 because I find no place in the Bible where he ever repented. Now, of course, you may ask me tonight, you say, when a preacher did he go to hell then? Does that mean, no, I don't believe he went to hell. No, I don't believe that. I'd have, to see, I'd have to see a specific reason why he went to hell. I don't believe that. Because the Bible mentions Solomon a number of times. Have you ever looked at it? Have you ever run the concordance and references to Solomon in the New Testament? The Lord Jesus used Solomon one time and said, Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed as much as one of these little flowers right over here. So he's talking about the great glory of Solomon, but he said, see that little rose? <laughs> That's more beautiful than anything Solomon ever had. He uses Solomon in the New Testament as illustration, as a, as a point of reference to illustrate something. But you'll never find one time, go home and check me out, you'll never find one time that Solomon is ever praised in the New Testament for who he was, for his uh, character. It's just not there. He's used to illustrate things, make a point of reference in history, things of that nature, but there's nothing in there talking about, have you heard of the patience of Job? How many's ever heard that passage? Yes, Job is being praised for his patience. And patience is a wonderful virtue. Job had patience. He'd had patience. And we could all use more of it, right? Amen. Job had patience. You see, but it never says anything like that about Solomon. It says Solomon in all of his glory was nowhere near as beautiful as this little rose, the rose of Sharon that we read about over there in the Song of Solomon. From a man who loved the Lord, and he loved him, to a man who taught the whole world about God's wisdom and about obeying the Lord in the book of Proverbs, to a man who comes to the book of Ecclesiastes and said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Somewhere you'd like to say to yourself, my goodness, Solomon, who could have gotten to you to help you when you started down that slope, that slippery slope, Somewhere you allowed the, uh, something to come into your life that began to destroy your very life. And of course, he brought child sacrifice, Molech, into Israel. He brought temple prostitution, Ashtoreth, into Israel. He brought some of the vilest, the vilest pagan rituals into his country and to his people. 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus stood in Jerusalem. And he looked across the Kidron Valley and he looked over at the Mount of Olives. The, New, the Old Testament makes reference to that during the time of Solomon and he brought the apostasy into Israel. He called it the hill. They didn't call it the Mount of Olives. They called it the hill. You see, but for what it had been used for, it had lost its spiritual distinction. But the Mount of Olives is very important because the Bible says that is where he he left here, and he's coming back here. And according to the scripture, if you've read the word of God and remember what you read, he's going to put his feet down on it. And the moment that second foot touches it, it splits us under. And it tells me that at the temple mount on Moriah, that the water will start gushing up from that temple mount, run down the Kidron between the Mount of Olives now that's been busted asunder and go all the way down the Jordan Rift into the Dead Sea and the healing waters will cause the fish to start jumping all over the place in the water that's dead. I've stood at the Dead Sea and watched people walk out in it and sit down in it. You won't sink. 
It is one of the most saline places. It's far more concentrated with salt than the Pacific Ocean is. And that salt is buoyant. So it, you go out and sit down in it, you won't sink. They, take, they, they go to the Dead Sea and they collect the water, they collect the mud, they collect the minerals from the Dead Sea. They bottle them up and they sell them to the whole world. And they make millions of dollars from what's been gathered at the Dead Sea. It just shows you how that God takes death and he turns it into life. You see, but during the time of Solomon, that that had been good at one time now was called the hill. But then below Jerusalem, going south, is what's called the Valley of Hinnom. And the Valley of Hinnom, 2,000 years ago during the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, was a perpetual trash heap, burning the refuge of the city. The stench and the smoke constantly rising up into heaven. Everyone, every Jew alive 2,000 years ago knew the history of the Valley of Hinnom. It was there that Tophet is mentioned in Jeremiah. This image to Molech had been raised. Ahaz was one of the kings of Israel that raised this image. And there they would put their little children into the fire and human sacrifice. The little babies would scream when they were burned to death. And they would beat the drums, they say, to cover up the sound of the dying children. You can thank Solomon for that. That's what they did in Ammon. That's what they did in Moab. That's what they did in Philistine land. That's what the Canaanites did. That's what the pagans did. But not so in the land of Israel. Because we've got the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We've got the true light. We don't need that garbage. We know better than that. And yet he brought it right into his own people. So why is he not in Hebrews chapter number 11? Not because he sinned. Every name mentioned in Hebrews 11 is a sinner. Amen. He's not in Hebrews chapter 11 because I can't find where he repented. And they're going to teach you a lesson in Hebrews 11. And the lesson's very simple. Life's hard. You're going to have problems in life. You're going to th have things that happen to you that you can't do anything about. But your faith will get you through. As a matter of fact, you'll rise above it with your faith. You'll be greater than your circumstances. That's what the lesson of Hebrews 11 teaches. And you won't find that in the life of Solomon. I would tonight that all of you would understand God loves you. God loves you. I've seen good men fall. I've seen good Christian people fall. I've seen them turn their back on God and walk out confused. I've seen them turn their back and walk out on God hurt. I've seen them turn their back and walk out on God for a lot of different reasons and pay a dear price for it. So sad. You should never run from him. You should run to him. God's consistent. He's very consistent. If he calls somebody a hero, they're a hero. If he points out an, ele an element or an aspect of their faith, he wants, to, wants you to learn the lesson of that but he will not be a hypocrite about it. That's why there is no Solomon in Hebrews chapter number 11, but there is a Samson. Somebody said, oh, well, preacher, how could Samson be a hero when he killed a bunch of people? I want you to read it with me. There's more to the story. Go over here to the book of Judges chapter 16, verse 23. Judges chapter 16, verse 23. Judges 16, 23. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. You see that? You don't have to study the Bible long to understand that there are certain things that flip the switch with God. <laughs> no, I don't know any other way to put it. You flip the switch. When they went to the top of Carmel and Elijah the prophet went up there, you know what that was about? It wasn't about Elijah. It was about Jehovah and Baal. And Elijah said plainly, if your God is God, let him be God. If my God is God, let my God be God. God loves that. When he went into the land of Egypt, 
The Bible says that he executed judgment on the gods of Egypt. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The Lord our God, if it is the right person, if you are a true believer, loves the confrontation that will take place between the true and living God and this garbage out here. In other words, all these other gods, they're garbage. There's only one true and living God. Amen. That's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God Almighty in flesh, seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen. Amen. And so what happens to Samson is that they're making a spectacle out of him. And they brought him before the people. He's blind. His eyes have been put out. And now they're going to mock him and make fun of him, make sport of him. The Bible says sport. That's the word it uses. They're going to make sport of him. They're going to get drunk. And they're going to laugh themselves to death at the God of Samson. That's why Samson said, Lord, <laughs> Let me push these bars down so they'll know who my God is. Amen. That's what happened that night. And buddy, did it come down. It came down as it always will. Amen. I feel sorry. I feel sorry for anybody who tries to jack their God up, prop him up, do whatever you need to do to him or her to get her to face the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's only one true and living God. Amen. Just one. Just one, folks. Just one. Amen. And I am so thankful tonight that I know him. Amen. That I know him and I belong to him. Amen. Hallelujah Amen. to God. <laughs> Bless his righteous name. Amen. Wouldn't it be and it's so sad, folks, when you see these people over here. I mean, they're serious as they can be. They're crawling around, cutting themselves. They're burning incense. They're going through all of this stuff to something they've carved out of stone or carved out of wood, some pagan God, which can neither hear, they can't speak. As it says in the Old Testament, you got a God and he can't hear you, can't speak. He can't answer your prayer. And yet you're bowing down to that thing. And I was born here where I could hear the truth of the true and living God. Hallelujah. You know what the book of Revelation is about, don't you? One of the things that the book of Revelation is about is that Jesus Christ is God and that he judges the gods and he judges everything, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. The occult world says to this day that Solomon wrote a book of magic like some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the big, big names in the occult world. Solomon wrote a book of magic and with magic formulas and with uh, talismans and with uh, approaches to the pagan gods and with spells and incantations and all of this stuff that makes up their, 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 their religious world. And uh, all you have to do is Google it and you'll find it's everywhere. Solomon, they say, wrote a book of magic. I can't stand, I can't say one way or another. I can't, I can't prove anything. I can't do that at all. I can't say he did or I can't say he didn't. But I can say this. I can say the God that started with Solomon is the same God that finished with Solomon. And the same God that finished with Solomon is the God that's here tonight that will answer your prayer if you'll cry out to him. Amen. Father, in thy holy name, I pray now in Jesus' name, bless your blessed word to the hearts of the people. It will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish that which you please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto you've sent it. It is the word of God. In Jesus' sweet holy name we pray. Amen. 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 All right.